This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about how to make changes to Bitcoin, how to add features that you'd like to see added, how to change fundamental things like the block size, for example. The technical description of today's video would be something like how Bitcoin consensus works. Now one way to approach the topic of Bitcoin consensus is to think about other kinds of consensus, for example, the consensus of language. How do we add new words or phrases to the English language and get everyone else to use them? The short answer is you probably can't do this. You can create new English slang within your friend group, but it's pretty unlikely that these new words or phrases will spread widely and become a permanent part of the English vernacular. Here's some contributions from Gen Z and Gen Alpha that have caught on to a limited extent recently. For real, no cap, skibbity toilet, Rizzler, El Riz, and Giat. Only a small percentage of the world's population understands what these words mean. And if you have kids of a certain age, you will understand what they mean right now. But it remains to be seen if these words are still around and in wide usage in 20 years from now, which is quite unlikely. So what we can say is that the English language is a social consensus that is beyond the power of any particular group to change. Grammar teachers can't change it. Governments can't change it. You and I cannot change the English language. The English language has changed drastically since the days of Anglo-Saxon, through Middle Eng English, through Shakespearean, Elizabethan English, on and on to the 20 and 21st century. But it's been a slow, organic process that's beyond the control of any small group of individuals, no matter how powerful. Here's another example of consensus, the game of chess. If you want to play chess, you're going to have to follow the basic rules of chess. And you could try to change the game of chess to include two kings or two queens at the start of the game, but it's it's quite unlikely, it's highly unlikely that very many people will be interested in this new version of the game. A North Korean dictator could force everyone in his country to play chess in a certain way, but this would have zero effect on what we might call the global chess consensus. And even if all the world governments tried to change the rules of chess, it's quite unlikely, it's quite likely that chess players would continue to play chess using the traditional rules anyway. Now, like chess, Bitcoin is a game that anyone can choose to play. It's a voluntary opt-in game. You don't have to play the Bitcoin game, but if you do choose to play it, you're probably going to need to follow the basic consensus rules. For example, if you're a Bitcoin miner, you cannot get paid more than 3.125 Bitcoin plus transaction fees for a block mined in 2025. And if you try to get paid more than that, Bitcoin nodes will reject your block and not add it to their individual versions of the Bitcoin blockchain which means that you'll have wasted a huge amount of money on electricity mining that block without being able to collect the block reward. Here's another Bitcoin consensus rule. If you're spending Bitcoin, you cannot spend the same chunk of Bitcoin, the same UTXO twice. And if you try to do that, Bitcoin nodes will reject the block that contains your transaction and will not add it to their individual versions of the Bitcoin blockchain. So your transaction will not exist anywhere. If you're enjoying this video so far, please help to support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button, that does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So now that we've established what Bitcoin consensus is, this sort of rough global agreement, who are some major participants in Bitcoin consensus? We of course have Bitcoin hodlers, BTC hodlers. We have Bitcoin node operators who actually use their own nodes to verify the authenticity of the Bitcoin that they receive, and also to use their own nodes to send Bitcoin transactions. So we might call these economic node operators where they're really using their node and they're not just LARPing and using the node that comes with a wallet or an exchange or an app instead. Then we have individuals and businesses who own Bitcoin mining rigs, who own ASICs. We have people who run Bitcoin mining pools where ASICs work together and share the rewards. We have Bitcoin and crypto exchanges that allow people to convert fiat to Bitcoin and Bitcoin back to fiat like euros or yen or US dollars. We have hardware wallet makers. We have software wallet makers. We have Bitcoin app devs in general. We have Lightning Network participants, both the corporations that are involved as well as the people who open up Lightning channels with each other or use Lightning wallets. We have Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Knots devs. We have large government holders of Bitcoin like the US government and China. We have large corporate holders of Bitcoin, like MicroStrategy, now known as Strategy. We have large individual holders of Bitcoin, roughly known as Bitcoin whales. And we also have small and medium hodlers of Bitcoin. In this consensus, we, often, we also have merchants who accept Bitcoin in exchange for goods and services. 
And so Bitcoin consensus is comprised of at least these participants that I've listed from the nodes to the miners, to the exchanges, to the devs, to everyone who participates in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And there are probably some other participants that I haven't really thought of here as well. I think it's also important to recognize here as well that the same person could be participating in the Bitcoin consensus in multiple ways at the same time. For example, the same person could be a Bitcoin hodler, a node operator while running a Bitcoin mining rig and contributing to Bitcoin wallet software if they know how to program. So what happens if one of these participants in Bitcoin consensus tries to impose its will on everyone else? Some examples, for example, Bitcoin miners and mining pools decide to increase the Bitcoin block size to eight megabytes per block. What happens next? Well, unless they can get the Bitcoin crypto exchanges to go along with this change, those exchanges will not accept this new eight megabyte version of Bitcoin in exchange for fiat money. And if exchanges won't convert this new version of Bitcoin to fiat money, then Bitcoin miners will have no way to pay their electricity bills and will go out of business. If miners move to eight megabyte block Bitcoin, but the Bitcoin node operators do not agree to the change, then Bitcoin node operators will refuse to add any eight megabyte blocks to their individual versions of the Bitcoin blockchain. And if these blocks are not added to the blockchain, then there is no Coinbase transaction that pays the miners their block reward. So once again, the Bitcoin miners will go out of business since they're spending lots of money on equipment and electricity, but are unable to get paid their Bitcoin reward. Here's another example. What happens if Bitcoin core devs decide to change the software to include eight megabyte blocks, for example? Well, then Bitcoin node operators will have to decide whether to use this new version of the software or stick to the regular version of the Bitcoin software. This is not something that Bitcoin Core devs or Bitcoin Knots devs can do unilaterally. So Bitcoin Core has no particular power over no node operators. And if Bitcoin Core were, were to go completely rogue, someone could always just copy paste the old version of the Bitcoin software for nodes and host it at a different website. This is all freely globally shared open source software. So when you hear the Blockstream or Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin miners control Bitcoin or quote unquote hijacked it, you know that you are listening to someone who has no understanding of how Bitcoin consensus actually works, or you know you're listening to a bad actor that wants you to do something. So how then can you push through changes to Bitcoin that you'd like to see happen, like new features, for example? The short answer is you cannot unilaterally push through anything. Instead, you need to be intelligent and polite and make a reasoned argument to the world about why you think a particular change should be made to Bitcoin. And you will need to get disparate groups like node operators, miners, exchanges, devs, hodlers, etc., on board with you. Now, you can always make unilateral changes to the Bitcoin software that you run, but if a large group of people do not follow you, you will then have fallen out of consensus, as the saying is. And this is really what happened to Roger Ver. He proposed some changes to Bitcoin. He even copy-pasted Bitcoin software, made a few changes to create larger blocks. In other words, he created a new version, or what we call a fork, of Bitcoin called Bcash, BCH. This was an actual network split, leaving two networks, the Bitcoin network and the Bcash network, as well as two assets trading on the respective networks, BTC on the Bitcoin network and Bcash on the Bcash network. And anyone who owned, everyone who owned one Bitcoin before this fork was able to collect one Bcash at the time of the fork. And then they had a choice. They could hodl the one Bitcoin and the one Bcash they'd received. They could dump the one Bitcoin and buy another BCH and another Bcash with it, in which case, if the exchange rate were one to one at the time, they would have two Bcash tokens, or they could dump the one Bcash and buy another BTC. So they'd have two Bitcoin, two BTC in total. And this is the process that allowed the free market to decide which version of Bitcoin it valued. Voting is great, but what's even greater is when people have some skin in the game and vote with their own money. So in this case, Bcash lost and BTC Bitcoin. One, as we can see from this chart, as the chart moves down, it's Bcash losing value to BTC, and it's continuing to trend to zero against BTC. The market cap of this fork of Bitcoin called Bcash or Bitcoin Cash is now only 6.62 billion, while the market cap of BTC is 1.72 trillion with a T. So here the market decided the winner. There was no hijacking as Roger Ver claims, doesn't even make logical sense when you think about it because you cannot hijack a globally distributed consensus. You can only hijack systems that are centrally controlled, for example, like an airplane cockpit, which is where we get the metaphor from. Bitcoin was not hijacked. Rather, Roger Ver and his friends simply fell out of consensus. 
Now this leads us back to our original question, what is the process for making changes to Bitcoin? And the answer is there is no well-defined process. If there were, then any attacker like a hostile government, for example, could use that well-defined process to destroy Bitcoin by forcing through changes that would be bad for the protocol, like increasing the 21 million max supply, for example. And if there were a clear path and process for making changes to Bitcoin, that would in itself constitute an attack vector on Bitcoin. A final point here, the larger that Bitcoin grows, both in market cap and global distribution, the more Bitcoin consensus participants there are, then the more difficult it becomes to change, to make changes to Bitcoin. And while Cardano and Ethereum keep doing one fork after another seemingly effortlessly, which is a clear sign that the consensus there is centrally controlled for these cryptocurrencies because they're able to do these very smooth forks, by contrast, Bitcoin forks or changes are virtually impossible to push through at this point. And that's actually a feature, not a bug, because your money should be stable and unchanging. For example, if gold were easy to change into something else, it would never have been good money and would never have been accepted as this global form of money. So you don't want your money to change every few months like Ethereum and Cardano do. This is one reason they continue to lose and bleed out value against BTC, against Bitcoin. You don't want your money to change every few months. You want your money to be a strong, unchanging foundation. If money is constantly changing, it then becomes too difficult for participants to make long-term good economic decisions. And this is one problem with fiat. We don't know what the supply of fiat or what the interest rates will be at some point in the future. And certainly the money supply of the US dollar is trending towards infinity. And this makes it very difficult for market participants to make long-term good economic decisions because the only node that's controlling the US dollar is the Federal Reserve. It's a network with one node. So you want your money to be more like gold or more like Bitcoin with a strong, unchanging foundation. The larger the Bitcoin grows and the more Bitcoin consensus participants there are, as we said, the more difficult it becomes to change Bitcoin. And we have a word for this. It's called ossification, where Bitcoin software ends up being updated for simple maintenance issues like operating system compatibility, for example, whenever Apple uh, Mac OS updates, then you need to update the Bitcoin core program so it can interact with that and you can download it okay, et cetera. Fixing bugs, these sort of things, just ongoing maintenance, no real changes to the consensus rules. This is what ossification means. And ossification is the natural result when a decentralized protocol takes over the world. Ossification is not a conscious choice made by the community, but rather the inevitable outcome and default outcome for a protocol that has become too difficult to change. There are some changes to the Bitcoin protocol and the Bitcoin software that we may see going forward since they are existential. We, we're gonna need at some point quantum resistant Bitcoin addresses to address the threat of quantum computing. We're also gonna to need to fix the Unix, Unix timestamp problem. But it is, fortunately, it's easiest to achieve consensus when the threat is existential, since so many of us have built our lives around Bitcoin and hold most of our net worth in BTC. So even if we have some form of ossification, it's clear that when there is an existential crisis for Bitcoin, the community will come together and is incentivized and all of our incentives are aligned to do what's best for Bitcoin as holders of Bitcoin. If you want to read more about the Unix timestamp problem, I'll put a link to this. There's a general, as I understand, there's a general uh, timestamp problem for computers beginning in 2038. But because Bitcoin uses a 32-bit unsigned integer for the timestamp, we have until 2106 to fix this. So most likely this will be bundled with some other changes and it will be done at some point in time, but we have uh, 80 years or so to address this. So there's certainly no rush. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. And I apologize for any outside no uh, noise from this video. I'm, I'm recording it out of a hotel room. And so there have been some noises. I'm not sure if they made it through to the video. But thanks so much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.